Falcho, welcome back to Irish Granny Tarot, our Saturday book, Beyond the Ashes, part two. Uh, by the time you get to this, part one will be uploaded. It's still uploading right now. Very slow today. We have bad weather. I think that must be it. Okay, so we just ended um, video number one with the idea that the uh, seven laws of Noah for non-Jews was sort of the bottom line of behavior that the creator approved of. You didn't need to convert. You just be a good person, you'd be okay. So chapter five, the souls of a million children. Of all the people who have come to the rabbi with this story of feeling a connection to the Holocaust, only one person claimed to have died as an old person. So almost all of them were under 20 and most were three years old or younger. So I don't know how they came up with this number, but the belief is that the average waiting period on earthly times, because time really has no meaning, for a soul to reincarnate is about 40 years that uh, it can incarnate, reincarnate as quickly as 10 months and go 800 years. This is based on a survey, so it just sort of depends. Uh, but the timeline seems to have shortened since World War II. And he says this may be due to rapid pace of change in the modern world. Um, life in ancient times was remarkably sa the same for centuries and centuries. Nothing really changed. And there were no new things to experience. So there was no point in reincarnating. It was just more of the same old stuff. But the pace of social and technical change keeps increasing. And as it does, souls are reincarnating faster. What happens between lives? Well, you can read Lincoln and the Bardo, that novel I recommend. It's an excellent book. I don't remember the name of the author, but it's excellent. And the Bardo is the... Uh, Buddhist belief that you die and then your soul kind of exists in this period of waiting between lives. So what happens? Uh, according to Jewish belief, you die and then you're met by a relative or some sort of guide who takes you across the barrier between life and death. And at that point, the soul is helped to evaluate its life on earth, which is the life review. And it is purged, cleaned, which was purged was the original meaning of the word purgatory, of, of sin. You know, you face how you made other people feel. And it removes the emotional pain. And it lets life be incorporated into the soul's higher consciousness. And then the soul hangs out until it's ready to come back. And what factors determine that are individual. Maybe you want to go elsewhere. Maybe you're waiting for somebody. Maybe you have something specific you need to learn between lives because the, there's learning goes on at all times. In an unexpected or traumatic death, the soul can sometimes not realize it's dead and wander as a ghost or want, might want to return very, very quickly to complete the life that it left. It may feel like it was taken out prematurely. And part of the problem with doing that is that it may return too quickly before the period of purging and healing of emotions has occurred. And uh, one of the reasons why Kabbalah was secret for so long was because during the Inquisition, many Jews were forced to convert. They were called the converso, I think. And they practiced secretly to hide their beliefs so they wouldn't get in trouble because they were pretending to be Christians. And uh, they'd get caught and they were killed as sorcerers. And they were killed prematurely. Uh, so moving on, there's the sense that a very large number, percentage of baby boomers um, were from the dead of World War II. I mentioned this to one of my daughters last night. I was talking to her on the phone and I was telling her about this book. And she goes, well, Mom, that's totally you. <laughs> so, let's see here. Uh, I'm 
what have we got here that I thought was important to underline. Although many people believe that we carefully plan out every detail of our Earth lives while in the other world, this is not always the case. In fact, the research of a Dr. Witten seems to indicate that it's only the less developed souls who have a detailed karmic script planned out for in advance, often with very strong suggestions from the heavenly tribunal. More advanced souls, however, decide only the main outlines of their next lives, leaving possibilities open for unexpected challenges. It is therefore quite possible to die through no fault of one's own, but simply, simply by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. From a Jewish perspective, there is indeed such a thing as bad luck. Because their lives are cut short, these souls often have unfinished business, which draws them back to reincarnate almost immediately. In many cases, they seem to have simply grabbed the first available body, regardless of whether or not the family would be compatible. Over and over, my subjects have told me that they were the odd one out in the family, for one reason or another. Many felt like total strangers in an otherwise happy home. Weirdly, past life trauma can emerge in this present life, but at the same age that it happens. So let's say when you were five years old in a former life, you drowned. Then when you turn, you're perfectly uneventful for the first five years of your life, and suddenly at the age of five, you develop a phobia of water. Some think that uh, schizophrenics are just not fully incarnated on this earthly plane, that they are caught sort of between incarnations. When people with memories of the past seek treatment, often talking it all through is enough to heal it, and the memories begin to fade. Being believed is really an important fact in all of this, and as soon as a soul can move past a violent death, it can progress in this incarnation. Therefore, the recommendation is, because he counsels people, the recommendation is if kids come to you with stories like this, listen to them, encourage them to talk, take it seriously, no harm done, you know. Uh, in the Talmud, uh, you don't even get judged for your sins until you're over 20 years old. Boy, I wish I'd known that when I was 18 and 19. <laughs> you don't get judged for anything because you're considered not mature enough spiritually. And then they have a, a bar mitzvah for boys or a bat mitzvah for girls. Um, and bar mitzvah means son of the commandments. Bat mitzvah means daughter of the commandments. And it's a connection to the heritage. Maturity, it's the age at which you become responsible for your own karma. The New Age idea that you create your own reality does not mean that victims of crimes or atrocities created or asked for it or manifested it. I really can't emphasize this enough. You don't uh, uh, bring down hell on your head. You don't bring down disaster and pain and sorrow on your head. Uh, you progress spiritually uh, by dealing with the events that happen to you in this life and, and uh, they're put in our paths as a lesson. Uh, so there's two, uh, this is interesting, two um, belief systems. On the right side is Adam. Yeah, that's your guy's right side. <laughs> On the right side is Adam. All this is created for you, Eden. And uh, on the left side is Abraham. I am but dust and uh, ashes, he was told by God. So you have, they, this is like a little parable. You have two pockets. You have the pocket of Adam and the pocket of Abraham. And in the pocket of Adam, uh, with uh, the ashes and the bitterness and the dust, every time you feel smug, you take something out of that left pocket. And when you're depressed, you take it out of your right pocket. And eventually, these two pockets, you just, you know, you, you eventually try to balance those out. The left hand of justice is balanced with the right hand of mercy. And that's just a little story that they tell. Chapter 6, Black Boots and Barbed Wire. 
this doesn't sound good. So this is a story from a guy called Donnie. And I'm assuming this is a guy, Donnie. I don't remember. I've read so many of these. I was born in June of 48 in a Southern Baptist family in North Carolina. As a child, I was very sickly until age six. During the early years, I was petrified by black boots, the shiny kind that go up to the knees. My grandfather had a rubber pair, and I exhibited great fear about those boots. My mother would set them near the wood stove so that I wouldn't touch it and get burned. I never went near the stove because of the boots. I remember going around the perimeter of the room with my back against the wall to get as far away from those boots as possible. I never understood why I was afraid of the boots until one day I watched a movie about Hitler and saw the goose steppers. These were those boots. I felt then that I had been there. I have generally avoided Holocaust movies. I don't feel that I have deep-seated hang-ups about them. I just would rather not see them. The realization that the black boots were there, that was sort of cathartic. At age 11, my Sunday school class attended a service at a synagogue. I felt as if I were on holy ground. It was a monumental experience that is still clear in my memory. I have always been very sympathetic to the Hebrew nation. I also have an affinity for the turn of the century through to the late 1930s. Oh, Donnie's a woman. She sent a copy of a letter to me which contained another interesting detail that was unfortunately omitted in the story that was printed. After the part about the Sunday school trip, she said, I also have an unusual habit. I look at magazines from the back to the front. Unless I'm reading a book, I always flip from back to front. And that's Hebrew and Yiddish. <laughs> then Barbara from Oklahoma. As a child in this life, I was always afraid of black boots. Shortly before my mother died, she was laughing about sitting black boots on the top of the cellar stairs and at the bottom of the upstairs to keep me from going there and how terrorized I was of black boots when I was not afraid of horses, thunder, lightning, things that small children are usually fearful of. The rabbi found many people who came to him with these phobias, and they recovered after he did a past life regression. They discovered the association with the Holocaust, and they were over the whole phobia. Often people go to a hypnotherapist to get rid of a phobia, and a past life will emerge. And often these are conventional Christians with absolutely no knowledge of the Holocaust, and they're absolutely shocked. They don't want to believe it. The rabbi has noted that many younger Jews today are reluctant to be fully involved in their religion, that they have um, a free-floating fear of practicing Judaism because of the Holocaust. He says this is PTSD. This is uh, from a former life. This fear, he says, it's related to fight or flight. Fear is uh, an an impediment to love and enlightenment. And so it's behooving people who have this fear to work through it. Many Jews today do word associations with Jewish words. And uh, when they do that, like studying um, for attitudinal trends, and they will take Jewish people and do a word association. And they, high percentage, associate Jewish words with negative and fearful terminology. Uh, Jews were targeted even though um, there were other Jews, uh, other groups who died in the Holocaust besides Jews as we know, homosexuals for one, Jehovah's Witnesses for another. Jews were often denied, uh, have never denied, that Gentiles were also killed in the Holocaust, but what many people don't realize is the Nazis not only killed Jews, they went out of their way to use the Jewish holidays and religious practices as targets for special treatment. So yes, they, they persecuted other groups, but they persecuted the Jews especially. Jews were rounded up and families torn apart on the Sabbath, transforming a day of joy into one of mourning. Humiliation of rabbis in the street was a daily occurrence. Sacred objects were routinely collected and publicly desecrated. Prayer shawls were made into women's dresses and sold in fashionable German shops. That's horrible. Torah scrolls were burned. Headstones from Jewish cemeteries were used to pave the floors of latrines. Horses were stabled in synagogues. When the library of the world's greatest Talmudic academy in Lublin, Poland, was burned, the fire lasted 20 hours, and the Nazis brought in an orchestra to celebrate. 
In the camps, it was even worse. Everything about Judaism was publicly shamed and held up to ridicule. Workloads were doubled on the Sabbath, and anyone who refused would be shot. On Yom Kippur, a holy fast day, the Nazis would force the Jews to stand at attention in front of tables filled with delicious food, such as they had not seen in months. Sometimes the Germans would taunt the hungry Jews by offering them a plate full of delicacies if only they would publicly consecrate, I'm sorry, publicly desecrate the holy days by eating. The concentration camps were designed not only to kill the body, but to break the Jewish spirit. In many cases, they succeeded. Eyewitness Chaim Kaplan wrote in his diary in 1939, The details of Nazi cruelty are enough to drive you crazy. Sometimes we are ashamed to look at one another. And worse than this, we have begun to look upon ourselves as inferior beings lacking God's image. The rabbi believes that this shame has been carried into this life through reincarnation. He says that many baby boomer Jews gravitated to Eastern and New Age thought because the trauma of the Holocaust and association with Judaism was still too painful for their souls. They were born into a house of mourning and could not find uh, happiness. Chapter 7, Healings to Karma of the Holocaust. Forgiveness plays a big role in healing, and uh, it, but it cannot restore old relationships. Both sides in a relationship have to address it, or it doesn't work. He says he can forgive Hitler. Hitler has to address his own karma. Judaism believes that if you harm someone, you must ask them forgiveness and make restitution before being fully forgiven by God. And... That's where the idea of victims' rights come in. The original meaning of an eye for an eye was the idea that somebody does you wrong, you do somebody wrong, and you go to them and apologize and say why you're sorry and say you'll never do it again. And then you make restitution. That's what an eye for an eye means. It doesn't mean uh, the Hatfields and McCoys, tit for tat. That's not what it's, that's a misunderstanding. It's not about revenge. Revenge is not allowed. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. It usually means paying a monetary compensation. And uh, the concept, an eye for an eye, meant that one person's eye is not more valuable than another person's eye. It was a metaphor. And it applies to the idea of karma, cause and effect. It's a really important facet of Jewish religion that I didn't know. And I think it's important for all of us to understand. Because I am a very harsh judge of the angry God of the Old Testament. And uh, a lot of the um, modern translation and interpretation of it is actually wrong. When you, he goes way into it in this book. And I, I haven't touched on all of it. But when you read it, you go, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't understand that. I thought it was retribution and revenge. No, revenge is not allowed. Uh, God is the one who judges, and this frees the victim up from seeking revenge. Justice is mine, saith the Lord. I think I might have just said that. <laughs> Let's see here. Justice on the earth plane is necessary for an ordered society, but it is often unequal to the severity of the crime. However, once we realize that God is indeed a God of justice, then it becomes possible to turn the anger over to God and not carry it around in our own hearts. Forgiving our enemies does not let the enemies off the hook, but it does prevent our own anger and hate from poisoning our souls. This is why we must eventually let go and let God, knowing that even those Nazis who seem to get away with it on earth will be called to account in another lifetime. And this is not about revenge, and it's not about punishment. It's about working on your karma. And they will be required to work on their karma. People comment to me all the time. How can there be, how can anyone believe in a good God? Well, the concept of a God sitting around judging and punishing and rewarding, that's foreign. That's not, that's not accurate. Uh, we are God. We 
do a life review. We look at what we have done. We see the pain we've caused. Then we come back and fix it, hopefully. I mean, that's such a simplification, but that's basically the notion. And it's not that there's an entity sitting back eating Cheetos and watching people suffer. I have struggled with this for a long time, and I hope I have some better understanding of it. I'm no, I'm no expert, believe me. You know, definitely read about this stuff. But the impression that I get is that uh, we're all one. We're all parts of God. God is us. We are our own judge, and we are evaluating uh, not in a punitive sense, but in an effort f towards enlightenment, our, our, our journey to perfection. We look at what we've done, how it's hurt other people, and then we try to make that good in the next lifetime. Where am I? Okay. Oh, <laughs> somehow or other I wrote that this applies to Trump. And I, you know, I keep saying, you have to have compassion. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit in the end here, but uh, let's move on. So Jesus reiterated this belief, all of these beliefs. This, is, this was the essence of Christianity. Grace, you know, forgiveness without being asked. Just forgive. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Just remember. Jesus was a Jew. In Hebrew, repentance is uh, the word for repentance in Hebrew means returning to the ways of God. So karma can be addressed without doing the whole tit for tat thing. Um, for example, a Nazi kills a Jew and then reincarnates and uh, gives birth to the soul of a Jew. I mean, he reincarnates as, a, as a, a, a just his soul, but then his karma is he gives birth to the soul of the Jew and gives that soul that he killed the opportunity to live again. And that's just an example. That's not how it always happens. Forgive and forget is wrong. You must remember. To learn from our mistakes, we have to remember. We have to forgive and move forward. Self-blame is common in the abused, psychological, and Jews uh, during the Holocaust, uh, they weren't being punished. Um, God didn't order it. God didn't allow it. Judaism doesn't believe in a vengeful deity. Now, this was a shock to me. So, Judaism doesn't believe in a vengeful deity. That, all, that whole biblical interpretation of, of Yahweh, the angry God, Jehovah, the angry God, is not accurate. It comes from some pagan beliefs. Uh, and, and he points out that the bloodthirsty God, Jehovah, is actually uh, from the Puritans. So, so, souls can choose the general circumstance of their next life and... Uh, the details may not necessarily be mapped out, and uh, to ne map everything out would to negate free will. It's all about free will. And we choose what we wish to learn, but not necessarily control the obstacles that others will create for us while we're working out our stuff and they're working out their stuff. Souls of the Holocaust choose, chose to live during the Holocaust. Um, the excesses of the Nazis were of the Nazis doing. That was their poor free will choice. We all are affected by the choices of other people and by our own choices. And it's not about what happens. It's about how we deal with what happens, how we treat other people. In the East, karma means action. The Talmud interestingly, says all of your deeds or actions are written in a book. Eastern karma is very similar to Jewish divine judgment. Both call us to account on our actions of our own choosing. We choose our lives, but the sum of our previous actions uh, affect our present incarnation. So they believe there are four categories of karma. Uh, the karmic group to which we belong, 
So they believe in group reincarnation, that we have emotional attachments. And we may not all be on the same evolutionary level. You may not always reincarnate with exactly the same people, but there's a core group that uh, you kind of hang around with, I guess. Uh, so groups reincarnate with emotional attachments. So like a specific religious group or a band of thieves. Um, the souls can progress and change in groups. The past history of the group is a form of cat, uh, karma. Um, the past history of the group into which we're born, so like the country or whatever, or the time period in which you're born. Souls are greatly affected by their own group surroundings in the physical world. And the problems that crop up as a result of that are the opportunities for growth that we're presented with and how we use our free will to decide how to treat other people. It's all about karma. Often those who are tested the hardest progress the most. And it's really important to remember that. Uh, there's also the sense that souls may ask for a difficult life, uh, either as an example for others or as a challenge to themselves. So it's not always... Um, I mean, it's okay, it's okay to have compassion and, and feel bad for people in horrible situations, but this is not about God punishing them. Often souls choose uh, to be presented with hard choices and challenges. And we bring with us our own kar karma from our previous incarnations. And uh, here's, th I think this is really interesting. Um, your astrological natal chart is the summary of this karma at birth. So if you have your chart done, um, you can see some indication of the kind of karma you're bringing with you. But it's not locked in, depends on free will. And uh, you are totally capable of overcoming negative karma by your choices. Souls can choose the general circumstances of their next life, but the details are not always mapped out. I think I already read that. Sounds awfully familiar. Uh, each, is, each of us has been incarnated here and now for a specific purpose. Uh, I, I say that a lot when people comment to me about being freaked out by what's going on. I feel the same way, 100%. I mean, I, I have no answers. We're all making this journey together. And uh, the only thing I can figure out is uh, we're here for a reason. We, we chose to be here. Now, if you don't believe in reincarnation, I, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, it's taken me 60 some years, you know, almost 70 years, to figure it out as inadequately as I have. But I do believe now that we choose the situation that we're in because it presents us in this time and place with specific lessons, specific people in your personal circle, specific community, specific religion, and then the larger global events all present us with what we need to learn. So the question is, what am I supposed to be learning? Ah, and I forgot to do my homework. <laughs> um, problems that you have to overcome are tests to meet. Um, personal challenges are unique to each soul. We all have to walk that spiritual path alone. We can seek advice, we can offer support, we can give love and compassion, but we all have free will. Um, your karma is also determined by the choices you make through your free will. Group karma provides a framework of, of reference in which to grow, and the soul uses this opportunity, um, and how it uses it is up to the free will of the individual. So, Jews who collaborated with the Nazis, uh, they made a free will decision. Germans who hid Jews, they made a free decision will decision. So no matter the situation, we can choose to renounce evil and do good. So you could have incarnated as a Nazi and still have done good. So these karmic factors are all interwoven. It's complex. It's not a simple thing. The rabbi usually counsels people after they've been regressed by a, a, a trained 
therapist. He advises that regression is uh, useful but not necessary. People can heal if they are heard. Sometimes that's all it takes. Hypnosis can be useful, but it needs to be confident. You need to know who you're going to. And as far as psychics go, he says some are genuine, but being a psychic doesn't guarantee freedom from prejudice. We all have prejudice. And uh, it also doesn't guarantee profound insight. Some people have gifts, different levels than others. Be cautious before you get a psychic reading that the psychic is not um, holding on to that particular psychic's own context of prejudices. For example, there are Christian psychics who would classify the Holocaust as a punishment that Jews went through, and that's not true. So the rabbi believes that healing um, these karmic issues, it's similar to dealing with any trauma. Now, this next part I just found so helpful, so interesting. I would, uh, I just think that this frame of reference is so useful in a lot of different ways. So if you've heard of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and she was all the talk, I don't know, was it the... 70s, it's so long ago, it's all a blur. Um, she came up with this theory about the stages of death. And he said that, uh, also grief, and he said that applying her basic concepts to past life regression, often, or any trauma, is often very useful. So he says to recover from grief, there's five stages. Denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and acceptance. They don't always happen in that order. You can have more than at one time. You can deal with it a while and then backslide a bit. It's a process. And he believes that grieving is a spiritual healing and how we deal with de death in one life affects your next incarnation. And he sees one of these stages often in people who remember the death from a past life and they're stuck in the process. They're stuck in one of those five stages. So past life regression is not a cure-all, but it can help. And he also recommends meditating, he recommends journaling, and he recommends talking. Don't bury the stuff. I mean, if this stuff bothers you, talk about it. Uh, address the memories and the emotions. And from a karmic point of view, uh, ask yourself, you know, do you feel like maybe you're stuck in depression or stuck in denial or stuck in bargaining? Work on those emotions and try to release them and you know, acknowledge them, talk about them. Jews believe in a communal karma. All Jews are relatives. All Jews are responsible for one another. And really, on a larger scale, we are all one. Uh, this is why when they pray, they use the plural pronouns. We have sinned. Bless us. No person is isolated. Everyone is connected. The Lakota um, say, I'm, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this. Mitakuyasin, which means all my relatives. Uh, the Buddhists, they take uh, uh, the vow of Bodhisattva which is a promise to reincarnate after they're enlightened to come back to help other people, uh, to help other people free themselves from the wheel of karma, to help us to stop making mistakes and keeping at it and at it and at it. Uh, and in the Bible, what do they say? We are our brothers and sisters keepers. We have to work together to heal. You can't do it alone. You need help. So the Holocaust has had a horrible, severe, traumatic effect on the Jewish community as a whole. Uh, not a lot is completely understood about Judaism. Uh, this book astounded me. I learned so much in this book. I've totally uh, redone my um, belief about certain Jewish um, doctrines, um, if that's the right word. Uh, it's a much less rigid and much less judgmental and harsh religion than I think we're sometimes led to believe, you know? I, I, it's very interesting. He sees, he sees, the rabbi sees ritual as a powerful force in karmic healing. 
And I think even people who do New Age, you know, burn a little sage. That's a ritual. It has been suggested that maybe the world could set aside a week of mourning to heal every year. And, oh, last week, I didn't know this. I think this is, there are no coincidences. Every year in Israel, there is one day, I forget which day it was, the <laughs> last week, but uh, everything stops and there's a few moments, I don't know, maybe six minutes, I'm not sure, of silent prayer for those lost in the Holocaust and in all of past history. And uh, car stop, people get out and bow their heads and there's this acknowledgement in the whole entire country, everywhere. Everyone does it at a certain time together. Uh, it gave me the chills and here we are reading about it. How, you know, what a coincidence. He suggests doing a whole week of that. Uh, he also says, and I think this is really interesting in, in light of our discussions with John of Aquarian Diary and Denise, uh, Denise Siegel, of the, the circle uh, repeating cycles of historical events that s connect because we don't do better. Our karma repeats and repeats and repeats. You know, Mary Trump's book. Um, the Holocaust is an eternal warning about our misuse of the world, each other, and technology. What happened after the Holocaust? The civil rights movement, the women's movement, the peace movement. There's this purge. We have the opportunity to do good, and then we foul it up again. The Holocaust permanently transformed the human consciousness. He believes that. War and persecution no longer seem normal to us. I mean, we were horrified by what's going on in Ukraine. Um, Sadly, not horrified enough by what went on in Syria. It's difficult. Human beings have difficulty relating. The more some culture is different from our own, the harder it is. We need to get over that. We are all connected. Uh, the victims of the Holocaust gave us the gift of insight that... Uh, war and persecution are not okay. That was their gift to us, and that may have been a choice of theirs to be able to give that to us. Chapter 8, Journeys of the Soul. In Hebrew, there are different words for soul. Uh, Judaism, he says, evolves with science, and at the moment, they believe in five levels of the soul. Uh, the nefesh is the biological life force of the body. The ruach is the lower emotional spirit or the ego. The neshama is the individual higher consciousness. The chaya is the collective unconscious of the group. And the yechida is the level of unity with creation and God. So then he gets really into this. And I intentionally did not write it all down because it's it's a lot. But if you're interested, it's really comprehensive. Many believe we're here to develop at least one of those levels of the soul. They're called the limbs of the soul. And they are often compared to the, uh, the tree of life. The positive and negative mitzvahs, the commandments, uh, thou shalt or thou shalt not, help develop you spiritually. Some are gender specific, and therefore you need to reincarnate so that you can be that other gender to experience the positive and negative mitzvahs of that particular gender. And all eventually will be fulfilled. Think of God uh, as uh, a generator, and we're the light bulbs, and we're plugged in, and knowledge of a soul's incarnations is the... Uh, uh, the light lighting up and it's preserved beyond the grave. It's preserved in the Akashic records. Comparing uh, different soul levels, uh, you can look at the Kabbalah, the tree of life, and going up that tree of life, you can compare the different soul levels. He talks a lot about that. Really interesting, really technical, and I didn't get into it. Souls can be earthbound by trauma and haunt the site of their death. And either they don't know they're dead or uh, they have stereotyped expectations of the next world. They go, oh, I'm dead. 
and but they don't realize well you know death is not what you think it is um they're waiting for like a guy on a throne or something it's not like that at all and they won't accept help from their spirit guides because that freaks them out because that wasn't what they expected or sometimes they know they're dead and they're like hey i'm not ready i have unfinished business at which point it's a little late Chapter 9, Cycles of Return. The rabbi says the Nazis are returning as right-wing fascists, and he said this in the 90s. The 90s. I just, I can't believe it. Uh, these are souls functioning on a low level, and they have set aside the rational neshama, the levels of the soul. They've set that aspect of the soul aside. And in the Torah, it says you should not follow a crowd to do evil. Somebody call Madison Cawthorn and tell him that. Learning to do the right thing under adversity is one of the most difficult things to put into practice. And I put a star beside that because that is often the volunteer job that a soul has uh, incarnated to do either for its own evolution or as an example to others. Jews were the canary in the coal mine of rising Nazi persecution for everyone. And when a group is mistreated, the nation falls. This is a uh, Jewish belief. The Sultan, okay, this is a story about a Sultan is reported to have said to Ferdinand of Ferdinand and Isabella, who ordered the edict of expulsion, um, kicked all the Jews out of Spain, and the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire welcomed them. And the Sultan said about Ferdinand, can you call such a king wise? He is impoverishing his country and enriching mine. Hitler, too, ultimately destroyed his own country and lost the war largely because of his insane hatred of the Jews. After all, Hitler reviled Jewish scientists like Albert Einstein, whose work ultimately benefited the Allies. Karma always comes full circle. <laughs> uh, Rabbi believes that in a soul group, um, you can uh, there can be soul groups led by Amalek, who's... Uh, they are, were an ancient group of anti-Semites. And this will tie into the conversation I have in the next video. Casey, Edgar Casey's readings may agree with this Jewish uh, attitude. Um, he believed in the sons of the law of one, which is spiritual, a uh, path of light. And then there's the the bad ones um, who would be like Amalek. So what, what Jewish traditional belief is, what Edgar Cayce reiterated, is that there are these groups of not so good souls that are just not evolved and who may never be evolved and who make life difficult for all of us and look for political power and they look for control of technology and it's not for healing, it's for themselves. Hitler believed uh, there was a universal battle of ice and fire. This is the Thule Society, uh, sort of a paganistic society um, embracing beliefs of ancient paganism. Uh, it's where the idea of Arianism comes from. It's like a neo-pagan religion. He didn't like Christians. Um, he was equally an equal opportunity hater. Um, he believed the Jews were a mutation from the past. And his goal, the Nazis' goal, was to resurrect the gods of the Nordic past. And they believed that Jesus was a blonde who had been kidnapped into slavery in Israel. He com Okay, the rabbi compares different soul levels with... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm rereading the same page. Hitler wanted to reverse the laws of God. I mean, literally said that that's what he wanted to do. And the swastika is a representation of that because it's the reversal of a symbol that was 
sacred to a lot of cultures and uh, they reversed it uh, to symbolize chaos. It, when it's going clockwise, the Navajo and the Hopi called it the whirling logs. The Romans used it in all their, most, well, many of their mosaics. It was popular in Tibet and India where it symbolized the four directions of the harmony of the universe and Hitler reversed it to represent chaos. Jewish rituals historically were intended to repair the universe. Mitzvahs were intended to send energy back to the creator for planetary unity and peace. Hitler feared this, and he knew that even one Jew alive doing mitzvahs was a threat to his chaos. Uh, the rabbi said, you know, it's using kind of a metaphor. He says the Jews are like white blood cells. They recognize the threat early. They often suffer the most and they save the collective, often sacrificing themselves to save the collective. I thought that was funny because it's like kind of a scientific explanation of a theological idea. Chapter 10, the Phoenix from the Ashes. Uh, Judaism was focused on hope and light at the end of the tunnel. Now, this is a characterization I, I, I always think when, I mean, and this is my misunderstanding that uh, the Jewish religion of the Old Testament anyway is kind of full of retribution and anger and uh, not good stuff. And that's really not true. Um, Judaism is focused on light and uh, he says, uh, quite unfortunately, since the Holocaust, the trauma of it has internalized the sense of victimhood. And um, people don't now consider Jew Judaism in a metaphysical way. It's not given a fair consideration for its spirituality. He said, for example, there's only a 23 year difference between the Mayan calendar and uh, when they had the harmonic conversion in 1987, the Jewish calendar and the Maya cal calendar went into sync with each other. They have a completely different uh, calendar. They don't go by 2022 in the Jewish Orthodox religion. It's like 5,000 something. Um, the time period between 1492 and 1945 is a time cycle for the Jews for Native Americans, for Mayans. Um, there's a lot of spiritual connection between these different uh, cultures and religious beliefs that maybe we hadn't considered. Um, he said, he went to this convergence and I had many opportunities to meet with tribal people all over North and South America. I learned about another parallel in our histories. Hitler had patterned his treatment of the Jews on the way in which the ruling powers in the Americas had treated the native peoples, a point which he discussed in Mein Kampf. The Indian reservations of the 19th century were, according to several speakers, primitive forerunners of the concentration camps, differing in their levels of technology, but basically with the same intent. Whereas the Nazis had used sophisticated means for exterminating the Jews, the American military relied on imprisonment, starvation, and smallpox-infected blankets to wipe out entire tribes who had no resistance to this disease. But in both cases, the oppressors had rounded up the people, confiscated their land and possessions, forced marched them to isolated locations where they would be demoralized and destroyed. Many Native Americans believe that they, like the Jews of Europe, were victims of a systematic attempt at genocide. Fortunately, both peoples have survived, although both are still deeply wounded by the experience. He says, I believe that we can speed up the healing process for Jews and Native Americans by actively confronting our prejudices and by working toward a more humane and loving world. In addition, we can each continue to work in our own individual karma. And uh, I would add something he doesn't talk about here. Um, slavery, the enslavement of black people. So do prophets really see the future? Are future visions merely just archetypical dreams or are they really seeing something? And he believes the prophets see what could happen. It's not written in stone because we have free will. He said Nostradamus may have prophes prophesied the Third Reich. 
he did predict the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and Napoleon. And after Napoleon, he said that there would be two tyrants in the history of the world. German, Hister, and he described uh, a war from the sky in airplanes, Nostradamus before planes, right? And then the second tyrant was an Arabian or a Persian in a blue turban. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Hitler was the fulfillment of the Antichrist. Jehovah's Witnesses refused to belong to political parties and they refused to serve in armies and they rejected conscription and membership in the Hitler Youth and, and they were persecuted by the Nazis. Uh, they Jehovah's Witnesses believe that uh, the swastika was the mark of the beast. And there's a Hopi prophecy. Uh, foretold that when the black road crossed the land and the white road, which they say is jet trails, crossed the sky, then two powerful populations would appear, one with the sign of the sun, Japan, and the other with the sign of the reversed swastika, Germany. And these two powers would shake the earth twice, question mark, World War One and Two, before the Great Purification Day. After the shaking of the earth happened, the Hopis were to journey to a large meeting house by the big waters where the sun shines through the walls and the chiefs of all nations meet. In 1957, six spiritual leaders of the Hopi and their interpreter journeyed eastward to the glass-walled United Nations building with the intention of addressing the General Assembly. They were unable to get through the bureaucracy and were told that it would take four months to get on the agenda. They left the UN building and joined journey to the Pentagon, once again were confronted with red tape. Fortunately, the local news media picked up the story and the Hopi were then able to deliver their ancient warning. And here it is. We must all live together in peace or a gourd of ashes will fall on the earth, poisoning the water and the atmosphere. The word Messiah in Hebrew means the anointed one. Anyone can be anointed. It's nothing special. Uh, it just means consecrated with oil. The word Messiah can also mean a mission. So Messiah are holy people in service of God, but they're still human. They can still make mistakes. They can uh, be a collective as well as an individual. A Messiah can be a group of holy people blessed by God to do good. The coming of the Messiah doesn't mean, you know, Jesus. It means the emergence of the age of light and love, repairing the world and transforming the planet, bringing the Messiah is the same as social activism. It's a shift in group consciousness. Therefore, each individual act of good work leads us to the age of the Messiah. And in the Talmud, it says, run to do a minor mitzvah as you would to do a major one. Every little good deed counts. Judaism uh, rises over and over like a phoenix from the ashes. Babylonian captivity when the first temple was destroyed, then the destruction of the second temple. The destruction of the first led to understanding that they didn't need one building, that God was everywhere. Then they were expelled from Spain in 1492, and they, uh, as a result of that, grew the Kabbalah. Their, their mystical spirituality increased greatly. And as a result of the Holocaust, there was a revival in Judo Judaism and Ju Jewish spirituality. So he attributes much of this um, to uh, this ability to revive over and over and over again to reincarnation. He sees the phenomenon of secular uh, and non-Jews as a rediscovery and uh, he sees this, if I'm sorry, let me get this right. He sees the phenomenon of secular and non-Jews uh, rediscovering Judaism and he sees them having a lot more demo devotion in younger generations and he sees that as a sign of old Jewish souls um, experiencing the joy of rediscovering their heritage and accessing spiritual knowledge of the past. 
He sees the same thing happening in Native American cultures. You can see that. They're connecting more with their culture. Now that they've, you know, gotten out of the residential schools. Ugh. He sees it as a, a new perspective in global consciousness. Margaret Mead said that the generation gap of the 60s was not about kids fighting with parents. She said it was the birth of a whole new global perspective, a group of souls that uh, had a whole new perspective. I think that's really interesting that she said something like that. He was part of an intercultural uh, program in 1979, all different religions. And he was amazed at how closely the prophecies that they shared, there's an Ojibwa prophecy about seven fires or periods of time about a thousand years long. We're now at the end of the sixth fire and the seventh will either bring complete peace or total destruction. He says, I was amazed at how closely this parallels a Talmudic uh, teaching about the four ages of Jewish history. 2,000 years of chaos, 2,000 years of receiving the Torah teachings, 2,000 years of the birth pangs of Messiah, and 1,000 years of the world to come. As I write this in 1992 on the Jewish calendar, it is 5752, almost 6,000 years. That would be the end of the 2,000 years of the birth pangs of Messiah. And Messiah is working towards light. Not necessarily Christianity. Could the seventh fire of the Ojibwa and the world to come of the Jews be the same event? And if so, what kind of world is coming? Uh, let's see here. For the Puritans, where many Americans inherit their religious concepts, the Sabbath is a heavy, gloomy day for dwelling on one's sins. The Jewish Shabbat, on the other hand, is a day of light and joy when thinking about sins is forbidden. We celebrate with prayer, food, songs, and fellowship around a festive table. And it, each Shabbat is considered a taste of the world to come, a bit of heaven. The prophecy is if all the Jews around the world simultaneously observed Shabbat, that would create spiritual unity amongst them, regardless of sects or denominations. If they could maintain that unified consciousness throughout the following week and observe a second Shabbat together, this would be enough psychic vibration to cause a hundred monkey effect, that is a collective shift in human consciousness. The same idea has been expressed by other groups. For example, Maharishi Mahesh Yoga, the originator of Transcendental Meditation, believes that if only 1% of the world were practicing meditation, it would have a calming effect on the planet Earth. Again, he says, we have a life and death polarity. We can choose the fascist path, of trying to convert, assimilate, or destroy everyone who is not exactly like us, or we can choose the pluralistic path of appreciating the magnificent diversity of individuals and cultures. As human beings who share the same planet, we are in interconnected. We are one people. But at the same time, each culture is special. Each person is unique with a spe specific spark that only he or she can elevate. Not only that, if we prevent others from raising up the sparks that they have incarnated to work with, then the whole process is impaired and the repairing of the universe is slowed down. We are, in a sense, a spiritual ecosystem, with each individual part contributing to the welfare of the whole. The Zohar, considered by many to be the Bible of Kabbalistic thought, contains the following prophecy. Do not expect the coming of the Messiah until the rainbow will appear, decked out in resplendent colors which will illuminate the earth. Only then expect the rainbow. So he says that only recently has the trauma of the Holocaust begun to be addressed. We're in an Aquarian age like uh, the first birds that sing in the hour before dawn. It's still dark, but the long night is almost over. And uh, he wanted to emphasize that when the Jews talk about being a separate people, they don't mean apart from other people, better or different than other people. They just mean distinctive. And they're not talking about we're special, we're chosen. They mean they're distinctive. 
Being Jewish is more than a religion because there is a distinct ethnic identity which has secular dimensions as well. I personally prefer to define Jews as a tribal culture in the anthropological sense. They have common ancestors, common language, common land base, a common religion, and common customs revolving around traditional festivals, and specific foods. Therefore, religion is only a part of being Jewish. There are many secular Jews who have no religious affiliation within Judaism. Some are even atheists who nevertheless identify themselves as Jewish and are considered as such by other Jews. But once again, he emphasizes we are all one. And I'm going to end the book by saying that um, if Identifying as uh, Jewish and feeling united with Jewish includes being able to have zimis, which is a Jewish dish that friends of mine made, or noodle kugel. Sign me up. <laughs> so that's the end of the book, Beyond the Ashes. Now, I have exciting, exciting news. I can barely contain myself. Uh, I mentioned a couple of times to remember topics because we're going to talk about them. We're not going to talk about them here. We're talking about them in video number three, a conversation with Melissa from Free Range Psychic. She does past life regressions, well, past life portraits, studies, and she's done numerous uh, looks at modern day politicians and famous people, and the reincarnation potential of them being Nazis or Confederates. And they're fascinating. If you haven't seen any, you have to see them. We had the loveliest conversation. I feel like I got a, a uh, master class in reincarnation from her. And if you stick with it all the way to the end, she does a little bit of a little bit of a past life regression for me. And it came as no surprise. I was a surprise that she did it. I would never have asked her to do that. But I'm grateful that she did. Thank you, Melissa. And um, it was fascinating, but not shocking. Really interesting, though. So I hope you come back for the conversation with Melissa. I hope you enjoyed this book. And I have one more book that's sort of about this topic and other stuff coming up next week. And then we're shifting gears a little bit. But not politics. It's okay. I'm trying very hard to have some interesting stuff that's not politics. So thank you very much for watching. Please be sure you're subscribed because that gets this information out there. You get more attention on YouTube. Uh, they publicize you more. Um, and the goal here is to get this information into as many ears as humanly possible. So thank you for watching and have a lovely weekend. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and say it and hope I don't jinx it. Knock on wood. Um, I'm having a conversation with Denise tomorrow, I hope. So, and then we'll read some cards tomorrow as well on the topics of reincarnation and the Nazis. So thank you for watching and in the meantime, Slangafoil and Slangafoil.